Thank you. And Tasha de Lake. Welcome to the Jewels of the Lotus Tibetan Gemstone Oracle. I see so many faces. I know. I love this. Thank you. Thank you. So, we are living in some pretty exciting times, to say the least. Time, things that we learned way back when, all the, all the Vedic teachers, all the healers, all the ethnic teachers, everything that was considered woo-woo, juju, and, you know, whoa, they're on another planet kind of thing, is all being proven by science today. As a matter of fact, science, I think, are the old-time alchemists just going crazy trying to catch up uh, trying to catch up to prove everything that we've said, and it is provable, everything just through science. So Tasha de Lake, and one of the things we're going to learn today, right, is that every one of you is a prismatic being of energy and light, a crystalline being from the heart of the mother, and every one of you, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, are dirt. And this is what we're going to prove today in today's class. So it's all a matter of how you look at it. So boulder opals are silicates of hydrous particles. I like to pass things around. I'm a video videographer's worst nightmare. Wherever he is, thank you very much. <laughs> I like to pass things around. I would say when you're done with it, the people on the end, except for my friend Rosemary, just put it on the end cap. You can pass them back. So you can take a look at that. Opals are silicates of hydrous particles in a colloidal state. It's the only gemstone that is not set in stone, but it is a stone. Uh, in the old days, they used to say opals were bad luck. They never were bad luck, nor was Friday the 13th, although for me it might have been the other day. Um, my mother was born on Friday the 13th, but we're not allowed to say that. Anyway, so because they're soft stuff. So they, things get reputations, and the reputations aren't always what you think. They're soft stones, so nobody likes to work with them because they fracture all the time. But the message with the boulder opal is to be in the fluidian of the divine, to be in flow state. We know that the world is not a very balanced place right now, and yet every one of you chose to be here now. Not so that we can sit in groups and drink tea and vent about everything, although we're going to do that too. But we are supposed to work with the energy to the best of our ability. Find your best crystals and know that you are the human crystal. Amplify that energy. Be conscious of what it is you put out into the world. I'm a double Virgo, so not convention about something is really difficult. <laughs> so it's very, if anyone knows any astrology. So I'm an astrologer as well. Uh, I have my little story, and then I ran into someone here today who lived next door to my astrologer, who was my spiritual mother. So, as a kid, like many of you, I collected big boulders on family trips. I used to put them in the back seat, and they'd be so big and heavy that my dad would complain, you know, a station wagon with seven people in it. But everything's so pretty, and that's what caught me first, is all the shiny, the shiny bits about the stones. Um, I do need this. Dad was a science teacher, so he gave me my first rock kit. Everybody remember those rock kits? And I just think it was the coolest thing in the universe, right? <laughs> and it's in my astrology chart to be a geologist or a rock collector. But you know how things just kind of flow that way. You know, you meet what you're supposed to be doing or what you're supposed to be knowing. It'll be part of your path. So at age 15, that was 1971, in case anyone thought I was a lot older. Um, <laughs> you all. My crystal journey began actually in the subways, under the subways of Chicago, in an out-of-body experience I had, in which I met a very luminous being. Now all out-of-body experiences, all uh, life after death or coming back, you know, near-death experiences, this is going to show in your astrology chart. I know this isn't about astrology today, but you'll get bits of that in here. Because in the work I do, I combine astrology with healing and crystal healing and nutrition, and, and that's the direction I chose to go. So I met a luminous man, and I could tell he was a being of robes and all of that. Now, I was raised on Lawrence and Kenzie in Chicago. I mean, I did all I could to stay out of the path of the old man with the scars and everybody trying to pinch your butt. I was not raised into this 
conscious kind of family. I mean, we used to go to Hostess Ho-Ho's and load up on that snack food on the weekends. And so to have this experience was pretty profound for me. I was led into these crystal caves and caverns, and I smelled violets everywhere. So everything was amethyst, everything was purple, everything was, uh, was gorgeous. I didn't know what the heck any of this was, but all I remembered is everywhere I went, I smelled violets. Now, in your own intuitive process, we operate different. Some people are very visual. I tend to be very visual, but I smell things. Some people hear a voice. You know, you're talking to someone and they're like, oh my God, it's just told me this. They usually show me this. I get motion pictures. Everybody gets something to whatever degree you get something. It's not a contest because we all have our own work to do no matter what it is. So if I didn't have these moments, I might not have opened up a 14,000 square foot store in the city of Chicago that also had a room this big for workshops and classes. I mean, it was Nadrine and uh, Linda know me well and Rosemary, so they know that I was a really <coughs> dervish for many years going from one end of the store to the next never slowing down, and that's why I didn't get to know Diane any better, because that was my life. I didn't slow down. I had babies and a cafe, and I just zipped around. Anyways, my friend at that time had a friend whose mother was an astrologer. I was not into astrology at age 15. Didn't know anything. It was all I could do to stay in school. And she took me to a Rosicrucian astrologer, and I don't know if anybody knows the Rosicrucian astrology. And she told me that I had a visit from St. Germain and that St. Germain would leave the scent of violets. Now, there's a difference between having a dream and having a visitation, and I'm sure most of you are aware of that. A visitation you can recall in details when all is said and done, 40, 50 years later, it still stays with you. You know it, you're there. And a dream is a dream which is symbolic that helps you through you know, or maybe has messages for all your friends or whatever. I like to sleep, and sometimes you don't get to. So that piqued my interest in astrology, and I started studying astrology at that point, going to the House of Sagittarius. I was doing charts back in the day when there were no computers, when you had to do everything by logarithms and do it by hand the way Helen used to do things. And I tell you with all honesty and sincerity, because I have a very busy astrology practice these days, that if I had to do that again, I would not be doing that. It doesn't matter that my dad was a math teacher. Some things skip a generation, you know? <laughs> so in 1976, I found Helen Bloom. And that's all my stories are long stories. Believe it or not, I'm cutting them short. And in 1979, uh, she got me back in school, by the way. She looked at my chart and said, oh, I see you're going to school, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, right, whatever. And I did it just because she knew everything about me. And then three years later, she told me to become a napperpath. And I'm like, what the hey is a napperpath? You know, I didn't use that word. But uh, so I went to the napperpath in college because through her, I started to remember this was the 70s. I thought I was cool because I was drinking chamomile tea and peppermint tea. And I just got back from Europe, so I knew what yogurt was, you know. None of those things were here yet. You know, I ate Brussels sprouts, all this stuff. Not growing up, though. <laughs> So she told me to go to the napropathic college and I signed up that night and I became a napropath and I couldn't believe it was what I've always wanted to do. Of course, what I really wondered is why she didn't tell me I was supposed to be an astrologer. That comes later. Because all life has a flow to it. You know, we do things, we put them away, we come back to them years later, it's the perfect timing. And that's the gift about astrology, but that's also the gift of crystals. That crystal that I just passed around, or any crystal here, even this beautiful Brazilian crystal, which they call a Lemurian quartz, which I argue about that all the time. But anyways, because you know, I always say I'm from Missouri, show me, but I'm not from California. But I don't always tell everybody because then they just think, oh yeah, you're into crystals. Anyways, now I was from, been here for years. These things take millions of years to grow. You know, it's it's the it's the fire and it's the uh, planetary movements and the great cosmic slop and everything coming together that pushes these minerals and metals together that form these beautiful crystals, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So anyways, in 1983, I went to an astrology convention 
uh, with Helen and her whole group, and met a man named Gary Fleck, who had two tables of the most amazing crystals in the universe. And I couldn't leave his table, even though I was in my Graceland being at an astrology conference. And I wound up buying his crystals, and I, um, I actually struck, I struck pay dirt, pun intended. <laughs> I started bringing his crystals up and selling them in Chicago. And that was around 1983, 84, 85. And in those days, nobody was in Chicago selling crystals, except for a few friends from the south side. Somebody had a place up on the gazillionth floor in one of the downtown buildings. I think it was the Pittsfield building or something like that. But other than Dave's Rock Shop, which is a fabulous rock shop, which you know became my new Graceland, uh, nobody was selling crystals, so I started selling crystals in my naturopathic office back in the day. I had a first floor office, and what happened is all of a sudden, I would take out these advertisements in the uh, monthly aspectarium, which everybody knows, and I would say, by appointment only, or weekends only, but everyone turned me into a store, and that's how it happened. I think that's how I met you, Nadrine, isn't it, back in those days? Uh, you were on Lincoln Avenue, right? I was on Lincoln. Well, my naturopathic office was on Lincoln, too. So anyways, it turned itself into a store. And some of you know me from my store, Healing Earth Resources and the Mother Earth Cafe, of which uh, I was blessed to uh, be a caretaker and put my energy into for 20 years. And then life changes. It changes. You know, books went to the internet. All the good bookstores, you know, had a hard time. And you've got to flow with those changes. So that was 2005 that we had to close. And what I did instead was I had sensed that I was going out of business, and I went into astrology, and I went back into my naturopathic work. But the universe is really funny the way it works with you. Um, I used to ride my bike to work every day. Those who know me, I don't drive or anything. But I was pretty buff back then. I used to ride my bike to work and uh, be a tough Chicago broad and all that. And then got hit by a car, even though I was with a helmet in the little old lady lane, she just got off some drugs and out of the hospital, and that's how life goes. And so it forced me into full-time astrology. Again, it's going, you know, you just have to not resist life. I joke and say I would have made a lot more money as a full-time snapper path, but, you know, you go the direction you're supposed to go. So that was the direction I was supposed to go in today. Um, I focus on uh, nutritional healing with astrology. I became an apropath, so this is what I do in astrology. I, um, when I studied with Helen, she was very big into nutrition. And so the people whose books we read were nutritional books to begin with. Career ops, timing, astrology is an uncanny, if you haven't had your chart done, I know many of you, I'm sure, have. It's uncanny, the timing cycles in astrology. And even to this day, Nostradamus predicted what's going on, or so they say, in 2018, which was given the date. You know, I hate to be the, come to the ugly side, but this is why we have to, we have to be better than that energy. We have to be aware of what's going on, because sometimes you have to fight, and sometimes you have to get back in the battle especially if that's your karmic uh, consciousness, what you're supposed to do. But for the most part, we have to do what we can instead of getting caught in the cycles of worry, which are pretty tough right now and may not get better for a while because from here till mid-August, the astrologies are really, really tough with little pockets of good news. And so I'm going to talk astrology for one minute just so that you know what to do with this. Capricorn is back, I mean, Saturn's back in its home sign of Capricorn for the first time in 29 years. So what do we do with this energy? Capricorn is all about structure and responsibility and organization. You're supposed to take your life for the next two and a half years and get as organized as you can, whether it's get rid of your debt, get rid of the antiques that your kids don't want, so they say on the internet. <laughs> they don't watch your junk, is what I'm finding out. Organize yourself so that you can be in a position of what the spiritual teachers have been saying all along, is that you're going to have to feed your neighbors. You're going to have to care for other people or care for the people that you love. So if you have a garden, I'm a gardener. I have no fingernails. Um, 
plant your vegetables, plant your herbs, do whatever it takes because people really need you right now. They need you right now. So being conscious, eating healthy foods, keeping your brain in good shape so that you can be of help and meditating. And I loved uh, Diane's opening. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. So anyways, I died from minerality and became vegetable. And from vegetativeness, I died and became animal. I died from animality and became human. Then why fear disappearance through death? Next time I die, I shall bring forth wings and feathers like angels, after that soaring higher than angels. What you cannot imagine, I shall be that. That's a beautiful poem by Rumi. And it really describes, believe it or not, everything, all the work that I do here. It talks about consciousness and how we've evolved through the different layers of consciousness. And it is the same thing with the mineral kingdom. So, I have a slide, but I don't know where it is ever. Alright, I don't know where it is, but that's okay. Everything's here somewhere. One of the, most of the time when you ask people, can you prove crystal healing is a real thing, you know, so that we don't sound like the woo-woo juju or, or, you know, <laughs> that we really were having a lot of fun in the 60s, which we were, weren't we, <laughs> some of us, is that to understand, um, Rudolf Steiner has a, has a, um, has a uh, quote, and his vibrational resonance begins in the mineral kingdom and ascends to humankind. Vibrational resonance begins in the human kingdom and ascends, uh, in the mineral kingdom and ascends to humankind. And basically what this means is that, and it started way before then, but we're starting here, that the minerals and metals in the earth through, you know, pressure and through gases and through, you know, collisions and earthquakes and earth changes over millions of years that unless you were a plant, you didn't really remember those days. They came together and formed these beautiful crystals, which due to their minerals and metals, either grew up or grew down or grew across. So one great story about that is that we have gold, and gold actually grows across, and grow, it will grow slightly up and slightly down, and when it grows down, they call it old money, and when it grows up, they call it the nouveau riche. <laughs> I like that example, but stories come from somewhere. So we have these minerals and metals that create these beautiful crystals, and they, get, they became beautiful crystals depending on the minerals and metals that were in the solution, okay? You can't make a crystal do something that the minerals and metals in the stone itself aren't prepared to do. You can't make gold do something it can't do on its own, or silver. Or, or iron. Iron has a heavy density to it, so it's going to be the rich iron core of our earth. It makes total sense. It's maybe not used for outer consciousness. Everything has a place. So anyways, you have those minerals and metals that form the beautiful crystals. And then you have the plant life that comes along and absorbs the minerals and metals that, ate the that made the beautiful crystals. And that's how you get plant life that's very rich in different mineral properties Therefore, you're going to drink down quiet tea if you need to improve your iron in your system, or you're going to drink uh, comfrey if you need to knit your bones. It's a bone knit tea. It's all dependent on the minerals and metals that were in the soil. So then you have the cow, the sheep, the plant, the fish that comes along, and they're going to eat the plant life that ate the minerals and metals in the soil that created the beautiful crystal. Sounds like a children's book, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the human that comes along, and we're going to eat the cow, the sheep, the pig, or go right to the plant life if we're vegetarian, or for pescatarians, right to the fish, whatever it is, that ate the minerals and metals from the, that the plant absorbed, that they absorbed from the soil that created the beautiful, beautiful crystals. And so what you have is you have this, you have this state of transference, those same minerals and metals that were in the soil, the dirt, that you've eaten one way, shape, or form, 
now becomes your physical body through a biomolecular reorganization process. And that creates the human body, or any body, or any form. Now what makes you different than the dirt, or the sheep, or the plant, or the crystal? It's your soul. It's your soul life. Whether you're an individual soul or whether you come in as a group soul, this is how, how it uh, manifests in the system. We all have a different housing system. But, you know, we have a predictable housing system, too. If they, we don't have the right minerals and metals in the soil, then something's going to be missing for us, too. That's a whole other explanation. You give me a minute, I'm going to go back to the beginning. I have a lot of Gemini in my chart, so I don't always like order. <laughs> so in the beginning was the word, and the word was Om, God, Goddess, the quantum principle, or whatever your concept of the divine is, the subtle organizing field of the universe that brings all life into alignment. And we are a spiral uh, galaxy that was produced by sound. You know, they say that the first uh, 30,000 years or so, um, there was the great cosmic hum, and that's what brought all particles into alignment. So could you imagine living in a world, excuse me, that sounded like this? For 30,000 years. <laughs> for a little bit. Oh, maybe I'm kind of short. Here we go. So the great cosmic hum was a continuous low-flying jet that brought all particles into alignment. Um, and this took place roughly 300,000 years into the creation of our Earth, which was at that time roughly 4 billion years old. And our universe is now estimated to be about 20 billion years old. So billions of stars in a galaxy all exert gravitational forces on each other. And the arms of this galaxy form a spiral density waveform. And so it was the spiral density waveform that brought our life and all life into alignment and allowed life to replicate itself and to form itself while it was on the Earth. Now what's interesting is that science always argues how this was done. Now, we're not going to go to the ET theory, too, because that could be real, and that could be, you know, ETs could be robots that are, you know, coming and bringing us back and forth from our starseed galaxies and all that. And that's all conjecture at this point. But we have sound, the bones in the body carry sound throughout the body. And so, lost my point for a second. What I meant to say was talk about clay. So when you talk about crystals, there are, has anybody ever heard of the Mohs scale of hardness? Okay. Yeah. So on the scale of hardness, you can have diamond, which is the measurement for the hardest stone, which means it can cut everything else. Or you can have clay, which is the softest of stones. Clay or um, uh, fluorites, there's a lot of different soft. Talc is a, is a crystal, believe it or not. And so what is believed is there's over 8,000 different templates of, Chris, of clay itself. And that in the sticky slop, little bits of crystalline particles, or you know whether it started from here or not, would find its way into the clay, and the clay would create this template, like a sticky template that would hold it together. And over time, it would become a self-replicator, and it would create life. So it's kind of interesting to think that we do all come from clay. Okay. So now we have piezoelectricity, and I want to pass something else around. And I always say make sure everything comes back, because I'm a material girl and I love my babies. <laughs> my children are even jealous. They're like, why? <laughs> um, anyways, I'm going to pass a bug zapper that came from China Books. It's really cool. And it's for when you get a mosquito bite, you just kind of zap. And it hurts a little bit, by the way. It's like an acupuncture treatment if you want to go crazy one day. 
Um, hold this close to you and look into it while you press it. You're going to see a little spark of light. Real pretty pendant you got on. You're going to see a spark of light come out. Don't hold it to your eye, though, because we don't want eye uh, the other way. Yeah. And then kind of like that. Yeah. I was thinking I need to put a black cone around it so you can see that. But that's an example of piezoelectricity. And you get piezoelectricity when you strike something. So this is something that Madame Curie actually and her husband Pierre Curie won a Nobel Peace Prize for because they were able to take um, black tourmaline, which I have here too, and crush it. And by doing so, I'll pass a piece on each side. They were able to light up a neon light. And so this is one of their physics chemistry experiments. We'll just pass a piece of black tourmaline. So everything has energy. And so, oh, I also want to pass the cochlear shells too. Because this will give you a perfect example of the golden ratio. Everything has a proportion to it. Thank you. Do you like passing things, or is this too much for you on a Saturday? I don't know. Then you get to see it. That's a cochlear shell. That's what we're in, ammonite. Am ammonite. Ammonite. So. That's black tourmaline. So tourmaline's a great stone that comes in many colors. But what's neat about tourmaline is you can crush it and it has an electrical charge to it. So it's the same thing with that bone, or that bowl that I was playing. Everything when you, when you emit piezoelectricity and sound is always in a spiral density waveform. So if I were to play this bowl on your head, which I might take somebody in a few minutes and, and give a demonstration, the sound from the bowl is going to be absorbed by the bones in your body, and it's going to travel down your body. It's going to spiral down your body. If you were to look at your bones underneath the microscope, you would see that it spirals on the outside. Because the bones of the body, the long bones of the body, conduct sound. And that's how healing is done. It releases endogenous opiates in the system, and that's how you get that's their, their natural pain relief elements. So you can use sound to heal pain. I see you shaking your head. Do you do this for work? I love it. Nice. <laughs> so, sound therapy. So you actually look pretty good. Do you want to come up and do a demonstration for a minute? No? I usually like a really tall yoga teacher because they're, they're going to, when you show spiral density waveform, which is the same thing as when you have two people standing together and one has a baby, then all of a sudden everybody's doing this. Everybody's in the wave. It's just natural. Or if you're sympathetic with somebody, two hearts connecting, the blood is a crystal, you have an office of women together, and eventually they're all going to start menstruating together because the blood is speaking to each other. Does anybody want to have a bowl plate on their head? Come on down. Come on down. You're the next contestant on the new Crystals Are For Life. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. So face the nice people. Take a deep breath in. I always say there's a different size bowl for everybody's head. <laughs> Take a deep breath in, all the way out, and breathe that sound into the body. Okay, she's starting to move. It takes a minute. You attune yourself to the feel of the wave, but you're feeling the wave, aren't you? Yeah. But this would be on everybody, whether you're sitting down. Thank you. Thank you. You're just going to start, and it's like being in a sound chamber. It's really nice. It's not as loud on the inside as it sounds like it would be on the outside. You just start feeling the wave. You do feel the energy. And your body conducts the energy through the body and produces endogenous opiates, which help to get rid of pain. 
Now this was shown, I think, by Dr. Mitchell Gaynor, who used to work for the uh, Deepak Chopra Center. So these waveforms create shapes of similar patterns, microscopic to macroscopic, as above, so below. And the Nautilus is a perfect example of that, of the unfolding mysteries of the golden mean. So even in every single crystal that exists, there is no random form. It comes together because there's an attraction of the electrons and the protons, everything binding itself together, the elements and the, um, what do you call it, the uh, molecules binding themselves together to produce the beautiful crystals, which again, according to the minerals and metals in the crystal, they're either going to grow up or they're going to grow down, and they're going to be a certain type of crystal with a certain type of energy that's going to work in your body in different ways. We're going to go through a lot of crystals, so... This is, a, this is a crystal class. So, you know, I was saying this is a really exciting time to be alive because back when I met Helen Blue and she told me I was going to be healing with crystals, another thing I looked at her and I'm like, what? You know, I like to collect a man, but I don't know anything about them. But anyways, I did turn out to be that person. And you're just in the right place at the right time. Now, she had five planets in Pisces. She was very psychic. But she always claimed to not be psychic at all, that she was using her, in astro her astrology. Because she did have an astrology head. She was a mathematician as well. Anyways, um, there's a point. <laughs> the point is, is that we live in a time right now, even when we started with things like color therapy, you know, it sounded so woo-woo juju until, you, until we developed technology like the spectrograph or the chromatographic scale, which we were able to then see the energy of the different, the wavelengths and the different energy of the different vibrations of different uh, colors. And we know that it uh, would react on different uh, glandular systems in our body. It's the same thing with aromatherapy oils. You know, when we first got started in this, it's like, oh, smell some lavender, it'll chill you. It's great, and it does, it's all that. But we now have technology for the last 30-some years, the gas chromatograph, which can actually measure, well, you're an aromatherapist. Hi. <laughs> I remember that about you. Which can actually measure the, the, uh, the terpenes and the sesquiterpenes and all the chemistries of the oil itself and determine exactly what's going to be a true oil or, or a, a um, high-quality oil, a perfect rose or perfect lavender or the perfect color blue. There's over a thousand shades of blue, but there's only one blue that's actual blue-blue. Now everything heals, but that's where science has now come to. Or the oscilloscope for those who work in a hospital, which measures the frequencies of things. Well, everything has a frequency. All crystals, all gems have frequency. And that's the whole theory behind wearing different crystals and different elements on the body. They're going to have a frequency, and it's like homeopathy. That frequency is going to match the frequency in your physical body. So it's not going to say, you know, if you're deficient in lithium. I mean, if you're deficient in lithium, you want to wear stones that are high in lithium to help turn the lithium on in your system. It's not going to make you jump tall buildings in a single bound, but it's going to balance you as a human so that you can come to do your specific work on the gravitational forces, in the gravitational forces, because I know you're all angels, and you all soar higher, we all do, but the reality is that we came into the physical realm to get the work done, to experience what it's like to go through gravity and the iron molecule. So one of my favorite stones to talk about, I love iron stones, and everything's somewhere. Oh, here you are. Okay. This is a garnet, an Alaskan garnet. I'll start with you. And garnets are very, very high in iron. Now, if getting balanced is supposed to help you with your spiritual purpose, then that's a very, very spiritual stone. But it's not a stone that's going to take you out into the ethers because it's not a stone of outer consciousness. Okay, so garnet is very high in iron. And iron 
forms the anchor for the incarnated soul to come into the realms of physical earth. Now that's a lot of woo 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 juju right there. Garnet forms the anchor for the incarnating soul to come into the realms of physical existence. And that's an anthroposophic theory. Now that might sound a little woo woo juju, but at the time of incarnation, the newborn baby has the highest iron content in their physical body that they will ever have. And every single doctor or nurse, the nurses all know, will tell you that. And that's why you have to increase your iron content. So what do you do if you want to attract a healthy baby? You wear stones that have, you know, iron content. Rose quartz has a partial iron content to it. So if you read the folklore that's out there, and they tell you that rose quartz is the stone to wear when you're pregnant, this comes from somewhere. My dream is to eventually, because I think, you know, and I'm going to tell you, I know a lot about crystal healing, and I know about nothing. Because we're all babies where this is concerned. I know a lot of people walk around and say they're masters. There are no masters yet. We're babies. We're just learning this stuff. If there were masters, then all these books would agree with each other. And they would say the same thing. And it would be like a physician's desk reference or something like that. And it's not. It's okay to blend your intuition into that. We do that because we're intuitive beings. But there is a bridge that creates uh, a passage from the science to the meta-science. And that's the work that Baby Dawn is trying to do with the little bit of crystal knowledge that I have. Finding that information about, you know, anthroposophic science talking about iron creating the incarnating soul's anchor to the fact that actually the newborn child does come in with the highest iron content they will ever have in their entire physical life. It's fascinating stuff, yay? Yeah. 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 I'll tell you one more and then we're gonna move backwards again because I don't stay on topic too well. I get too excited. I'm just an excitable girl. Okay, this gemstone here is dioptase. And dioptase looks like a rich find of, of emeralds. But they're pretty, they're pretty expensive in their own right too. Now, dioptase is, um, has a high degree of water with copper. And water with copper, according to anthroposophist Rudolf Steiner, or, uh, no, Rudolf Hauschka. Everybody familiar with the Hauschka products? Beautiful products, they're very expensive, but I love them. Um, talks about the right time to pick your herbs, which now is common knowledge with most people who do biodynamic farming. And, and growing in agriculture, the spiritual health agriculture, is you know that you pick your herbs when the dew content is at the highest. It's usually six in the morning or six at night. And that's when you prepare your formulas. You don't want to just be a random company that just goes farming because you might not have all the elements, even the spiritual elements, that are needed in the plants that you're picking. So this is copper and water, and copper and water forms beautiful forms. I usually tell pregnant women to wear that. It's a very interesting story um, because at the time of birth, well, first of all, copper creates the envelope. It creates the envelope that protects the incarnating soul and brings them to the heart center of the body, which green is the color, the designated color for the heart center. So interestingly enough, at the time of birthing, the birthing mother has three times the copper in her physical body that she will ever have in her entire life at the time of birthing. And this is why copper is so needed. So is it possible, I've never done a study on this, but I've always talked about it when I do this class and then forget to do it. Is it possible that a copper deficiency could be the problem in postpartum uh, issues, you know, with women, that they don't have enough copper. Now that would be shown in the astrology chart too, because Venus rules copper, and you have to have, you know, Venus in good harmony in your astrology charts to have copper in a balanced position. Just something to think about. This is, you know, we're babies in all of this, and this is where we're going. Any questions thus far? Okay go back to where I was at one point. <laughs> okay. Did I do that?
this? Okay, so it's really interesting that I didn't say that the ability to broadcast, conduct, and transmit, transmit energy is called piezoelectricity. So that was like that little pe that uh, bug zapper, which was pressure against a quartz crystal, which shows you the energy that's generated. Thank you for doing that. The pressure against a quartz crystal. So you know when you're out in the wilderness and you find a quartz crystal and you want to start make a fire, <laughs> you got to rub two quartz crystals together. There was actually truth to that, but if you saw Tom Hanks in uh, whatever that movie Castaway was, you know your hands will go raw first. So don't do it. <laughs> Anyways, this ability to create piezoelectricity, which is the electricity of your physical body, is common to bone, quartz, tourmaline. And in our own body, piezoelectricity is found in our bones, our keratin, collagen, the entire brain, nucleic acid, tendons, dentin, the aorta, the trachea, the intestines, elastin, and our entire <coughs> skin and blood. So we function on crystal principles. We function on piezoelectricity. So Tibetan bowls, like the Tibetan bowl I played a minute ago, are made out of, has anybody ever taken classes on Tibetan bowls? I know some of you have. They're made out of seven different uh, metals. And these metals represent the energy of the different planets. And they have energy in the body. So this isn't just a random you know, assembly line production. These are passed down through the family. and I get excited by Tibetan bowls. I like to say I collect them, but I never collect as much as I'd like to because we also have to eat. But they weigh these the same way in grams, the same way you weigh diamonds and rubies and everything else, and silver, so, or plant, platinum. So Tibetan bowls are created from family recipes of seven sacred metals, lead, which represents Saturn, Copper, which represents Venus. Tin, which represents Jupiter. Did you know that you have to have tin in your body or you'd be dead? Even lead. You have to have everything in its right proportions. You don't want extra, and I'm not recommending anyone moves to Flint, Michigan or anything. As a matter of fact, we need to all send them little bits of money or fresh water or do what we can. And that's everywhere in the world. We can cut some of our Starbucks out. I cut that long time ago. We can cut some of the things we do to help the world because in the long run, we have to really look at what's important. Okay, this isn't an ethics class, but I'm a double Virgo, I go there. Okay, so tin in the body, just out of interest, is actually stored in the liver and one other organ in the body because tin has a very malleable um, shape to it. It's very plastic in nature and you have to have it in your system for your liver to function, but you don't want to have an overabundance of it or you basically die, like they did in the pewter cups when they were drinking uh, at the night's table, drinking out of pewter cups. But it's also found in the tongue. The tongue has a high degree of plasticity to it. So in homeopathic or anthroposophic medicine, you use, you use different elements that can even complement, like even in astrology, different planets complement other planets and you can use certain things as a substitute so you can use as a substitute silver colloidal silver because the moon goes really nicely with Jupiter just a thought I'd share with you so if you had cirrhosis of the liver if you had hardening of the liver you would want to soften it you know in the old days they used to think that uh, cirrhosis of the liver only came from alcoholism and we know now that it's actually very ancestral for different types of people. It runs in my family. And, you know, they're Jews and they can't drink. So. <laughs> Making a joke. Huh? Poor nutrition. Poor nutrition, yes. My grandma died of two more minutes? Is okay. it break time? Okay, yeah. Two, two more minutes. Just sit patient. Okay. Uh, silver, which is ruled by the moon. Gold, which is ruled by the sun. Well, silver actually could also be mercury, so let's go there. And platinum we'll give to the moon. So basically, they have the different elements of the seven planets that were known to humankind before we learned about Uranus, Pluto, and Neptune. And we can't go back now because they're destructive. And it's part of what we're going on today, what's going on today in the cycles astrologically of the past decade 
because Uranus and Pluto only come together roughly every 45, 50 years. And they came together in a square, which interestingly enough, you can look at the astrology of different companies like Monsanto, which got started in the 1890s, which started on a Uranus-Pluto square. So every time it comes up, they come up with different things. Like in the 60s, it was the Agent Orange. And right now, the big thing, of course, is the gly glyphosates. I can never say it right. Um, that's found in our wheat. So another interesting thing, because I love all these tidbits of astrology, is that the planet Ceres, which rules Crohn's disorders and celiac disorders and leaky gut syndromes, uh, was founded in the 70s at the time that wheat bread became popular and the whole Adele Davis cycle. And now we have certain aspects going on with Ceres, and now we have the issue of the gluten intolerance. See, so everything has its cycle, and it cycles back. And we're all just babies trying to figure it out, but we're having a good time. Okay, I think it's break time. <laughs> so I'm just going to run through some of the slides really fast, because I have lots of slides. Is this really on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can hear me then with that. So I have a friend, uh, Roxanne Kremer, who's... Uh, Head of, uh, has a, um, a foundation called the Preservation of the Amazonian River Dolphins. And she used to use what's called Diamantina crystals. They were long crystals. I actually didn't bring any today, or I'd do a demonstration of that, where she would take the two and knock them together and play them underwater. They had a higher vibration uh, than uh, a slower, they had a slower actual uh, rotation to them. So let me just share with you. So she used to work with the, the pink river dolphins and they would come to her when she would be playing those crystals. So crystals have a frequency that you can hear underwater as well based on uh, the 8 hertz and the Schumann global resonance range. So they produce relaxing alpha states. So you can just hold the crystal and have, uh, you know, go into a relaxing state as well. Um, I wanted to say really quickly, and I think I'll just talk really loud. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. I usually speak pretty loudly. One of the, I've seen a lot of throughout time. Now listen, all crystals are gorgeous, and I want to own them all, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of people have big polished crystals. And they are wonderful because they give off energy and frequency. But if you want to do healing work, it's recommended that you have natural, unpolished crystals, unless you're dealing with vocal crystals, and that's a whole other subject on frequency because they are, uh, they are uh, shaped prismatically to let off certain frequencies and vibrations. But I can't remember what power versus force used to say, but the average human energy field is somewhere around 200. Uh, hertz frequencies and crystals emit at least 333 and then depending on the crystal frequency it can be higher and then of course depending on the energy that you input into the crystal which is a whole other subject that I teach too but let's just if you're going to do one thing you want to have as natural a crystal as possible because the energy that's emitted from the quartz crystals <coughs> travels through, again, spiral density wave forces. It's, it travels through the C-axis of the crystal and emits a spiral energy which is actually measured scientifically. And if you don't know where the tip of the crystal is, which is the emitting force of the C-axis, then you don't know where the energy is. So there's a lot of crystals that are really gorgeous. Now, not all crystals, not all stones, gemstones, form beautiful points like this. So for instance, my very gorgeous, okay, where's the second? My very gorgeous Sujalite, which is purple from the Kalahari region of Africa, actually has a very high lithium content to it. We're not going to totally talk about lithium stones today, but lithium stones, um, certain gemstones like uh, the Kunzite family, actually have more CoQ10 in it than the actual vitamins. Yeah, it's crazy when you think about it. So that's how come if you wear different gemstones, they have a different nutritional component via homeopathy, anthroposophy, whatever systems you're using. 
frequency and you wear them on the body, you're actually getting your nutrition as well. Now, <laughs> has everyone measured it? Is it scientific? Not exactly yet. But this is where we're going to. Yes? Where is uh, the best place to buy the most natural Yeah, I, I think, you know, the question is, is where is the best place to buy natural stones? I think it's an art that you're going to have to learn. You know, I would have said years ago it was my place because I loved shopping and I would pick amazing stones. And that's really how I got started in the business. I would just hand pick these gems, these beautiful crystals, back in the days when they were dirt cheap, pun intended. And I used to bring things, you know, into, in, into our sales and people would be, you know, today sometimes, you know, the little numbers add up in my head and I'm like, God, I let that go. 40 years ago, and now it's worth, you know, I have crystals that I pay $200 for, they go for like three, 4000 these days. But if I only knew then, when I was still <laughs> financially strapped, we'll, we'll just leave it like that. So anyways, going back to this crystal, and I forgot what I was saying, you can take a beautiful crystal like the block of sujolite that I passed around. And that's just going to have a generalized energy frequency as far as its radiance of energy. Because it doesn't have a crystalline point like quartz crystal, like tourmaline, like rose quartz to some degree. And let me actually show you rose quartz. Because almost all the rose quartz you see on the market has been polished. But rose quartz actually really does have crystals. They're just not big enough to make into those big beautiful pendants and things like that. So everything's relative to what the crystal's able to show you. So if you take a crystal and you have this big polished crystal or little polished crystal, and you don't know if it started off as a block, you don't know if they're polishing that to where the frequency is going out through the tip that they manufactured. You could be sending energy to your best friend in Paris, which I always say the shortest distance, face that direction, face east. And then maybe it's going off the butt of the crystal. Now that doesn't mean that your intention doesn't count for something. But you need to know how to work with crystals. So this is a bone I pick also with the crystal grid work, grid work, which is really big out there. It really helps to direct the flow of energy and know what you've got. Know that you're putting crystals in between the crystals so that you have a direction to the, to the flow that you want. To the healing that you want to be doing. You want it to be most effective. It's not arbitrary. Your intention may override all of that, the integrity of your intention, the intensity of the integrity of your intention, may override all that, and someone's going to get a great healing anyways. But you can have the crystal work for you more effectively, and then, of course, work with it by touching it. The crystals are going to work a lot better if you have them in your energy field, because they release piezoelectrical forces. So, so now, when we change the hertz sound or frequency, and this goes to anything, and this goes to homeopathy, this goes to water, anything, water molecules influenced by the frequency and measurements of hertz form infinite patterns as shown in the Clodney plates. Now, you've probably seen some of these experiments online where you see the big copper, you know, like plates, and they have rice, or they have... Uh, sand on top of it, somebody plays a violin bow, or they, they emit a certain frequency, which by the way, crystals hold that frequency. You can program a crystal with frequency as well. I used to know a crystal teacher back in the day when I was starting out, Dr. Randall Bear, whose frequency became too much for this planet, and he had to leave. You know sometimes things happen in this world where we have to leave, where the frequency is just too woo up there. Anyways, he used to have a library of hundreds and hundreds of stones, and he was a Capricorn, so he had each of them listed as to what frequency, whether it was Brahms lullaby or whatever that he had programmed it with. But you can just take a crystal and just do one of your meditations or just do one of your invocations. I am light. I like to speak it into the crystal or hold it up to the heart center. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. The goddess, um, uh, I say it God all the time, sorry. God can, uh, okay, I'm put on the spot, forget it. Okay, so anyways, the point, 
I lost it. I lost it. She got put on the spot. The, free, the point I'm making right here is this is an example of the Claudney plates. And you just change the Hertz frequency ever so gently, and you're changing the whole outpicturing of the molecule. It's really fascinating. I know you too, don't I, Nancy? We used to come to the, uh, to the vegan potlucks we used to have. I remember, I remember you. <laughs> I kept looking at you, and sometimes you see faces. Unfortunately, one of mine fell in between the cracks here, and I have to go see if I can find it later. And that would have been the frequency of the shakahatri flute. But I'm going to show you the different frequencies. You just change the frequency, and you change the outpicturing of the molecule. Okay, what does that look like? Looks like a gong. And this is the frequency sound of a gong. And this is the sound of a whale, a whale song. Again, different frequency, so it's going to look different than the sound of the gong. Why this is relevant, because this is also what brings crystals into coherence and creates their form, which is also based on the molecules, the minerals and molecules that are found in the, uh, in the mix. Now this, and I think I have one other, I think that dropped in between two. Oh my god, two of them are down there at least. <laughs> I, I, they got a little too close to the edge there. Uh, this is the voice of the first day. This is a didgeridoo. Now when you look at it, it kind of looks like a didgeridoo. And you wonder where these creation stories come from. If you've seen the didgeridoo, um, it, that's the sound of the didgeridoo, but if you've seen the aboriginal creation stories, it looks like the humans chasing the kangaroo, chasing the this, and it's a very circular. And then if you deal with um, the didgeridoo alone, you're going to have the circular breath when you play the instrument, for people who do that. It was kind of one of my parties the last year. You got to have the didgeridoo to play it. That's awesome. Well, we always get something, you know, in life, but we don't always get everything. I have a husband who plays the didgeridoo and drums, so that's my, that's my pot of gold. We get a pot of gold somewhere. Everybody's astrology chart has a pot of gold in there. And the, you know, I always say the universe gives us some amazing, amazing gifts, and some of them we get screwed out of. But you know, <laughs> but we do get what we need, and it's you know what we need, what we what we ask for to come down here to do the work that we need to do. You know, if you had a whole bunch of things that you really, really didn't need, they keep you from being that great author, or that great musician, or that great compassionate gardener, or whatever. Okay, now this is the Aeolian flute. It even looks like an Aeolian flute. So we'll pass that around. But sound is what brought everything in our universe into coherence. Okay, frequency can unlock ancient encodements as enchanting, which is another form. The sequencing keys that open time and dimensional gates. <coughs> Some things we're going to skip, but after the Big Bang, it released a whole bunch of elements like helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron, and all of these have very low specific gravities, as you can see on, um, on the periodic table. So I'm going to pass some periodic tables, but we're going to get to that a little bit later. Yikes. I have another stack of them, and I don't know where they are. In my life, everything's somewhere. I'm like, <laughs> so just like one per row, keep it, or just don't even worry about it, because I'll hold it up and I'll show you. But to give you an idea of something really cool, I pass that one stone out. That uh, I'm going to pass a few of these out, and this is. This is a piece of lapidolite, and we'll get to that one. I think I'm going to jump there right now. And then I'm passing out a couple pieces of kunzite. The kunzite's very expensive, so I want to see them back for sure. Um, but 
I'm also going to pass out Share One with the Neighbor, because I don't have enough for everybody. I didn't know how many would be here today. So Share One with the Neighbor and pass them back. What I'm passing out right now is a chart from the book Let There Be Light by Dr. Garadelli Dinshaw. And he is the father of color healing. He knows more than anybody. Of course, he took it to the grave now, but anyways. What I want to say about him, he was the real deal. He'd been arrested many times and had his equipment confiscated. Because he was, that's, that's what makes you the real deal. Ask me how many times I've been arrested. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Just once. It was for drinking beer in a park when I was young. <laughs> Doctor, well, his son put out the book. It's called Let There Be Light. You can pass that around. The point being is he took different minerals and metals and he put them on a spinner and he was able to see the bioluminescence, the energy that came out of the different minerals and metals. And all minerals and metals have a color frequency. So you see that piece of lipidolite that I passed around? And it has kind of a magenta-like look to it. And just This is a high lithium pond. Those stones I passed out are very high in lithium. Yes, they're lithium stones. You wear the vibration of lithium. You look at the periodic table. And lithium is the third lightest element on the, period, the periodic table, which means it's not heavy. The whole purpose of lithium is to uplift you. Mm -hmm. Right? It's to lift depression, lift heavy energy. So if you had a depression, a depression, you might, or if you're being treated for it, you might want to wear gemstones that are high in lithium. So that would be kunzite, sujolite, that would be probably lipidolite for sure. That piece of lipidolite I'm passing around, they actually used to crush it up and make pharmaceutical lithium out of it. But now they don't do that. But this is the Solar de Yeuni in Bolivia. And if anybody has a lot of money, I want to go, but I don't have the bucks. I'll be your tour guide. I'll be your tour guide for the day. <laughs> you go there, and you can actually drive on this. This is lithium salt. They used to, they, today they make lithium salt pools and that's where they get the lithium for the pharmaceutical. And anybody who studies herbology knows that a lot of herbology is also what they use for different uh, medical uh, uh, pharmaceutical drugs as well. Like Digitalis from Foxglove. I know we have doctors in the group, I'm looking at them. Anyways, modern science is reaffirming what the ancients observed in their world and taught their myths, that there's a consistent geometric language a design that underpins every level of the universe from atoms to galaxy. Lithium is always going to form itself in, he in hexagonal shapes. And that's the same with quartz crystal. Every single quartz crystal, no matter whether it's a pebble on a beach or a big earth keeper quartz that holds our planet together, is always going to be six-sided of the body. Now, if you want to see that again, you can pass this around again and just look at the body of the quartz and put your thumb on one, one angle and go all the way around and you will see six sides. Whether it's microscopic or humongous, it's always going to be six sides and that's what lithium does as well. So you can't make a gemstone do something it's not prepared to do. You cannot make lithium be heavy like iron or deuterium or something like that. It's got to be light. So when you're working with light energy, these are the stones that you want to wear. If you're a heavy person energetically, you want to wear stones that's going to lighten up your consciousness. Now, most of you are not heavy people, and we need to be grounded so that we can do our work, and that's why it's more advantageous sometimes to wear stones like iron. Because we need our iron. I don't know about you, but I was born with a vitamin B12 deficiency, which is an iron deficiency. There's a whole story with that, but I only share it in nutritional astrology. <laughs> the 
point being is that you're here to do your work upon the planet. And if you're here to do your work upon the planet, you don't want to just stay in that ultra zone all the time, even though it feels so good. You have to meditate, listen to Diane's flute a little bit more. It's a good place to go. Okay. I'm going to go back to where I was and just go through a few things. Okay, so meteors in, in, in uh, anthroposophic science, which I talk about a lot. Okay, where is it? This is a meteor that I got from a shaman in Peru. I really did. I think he liked me because I brought a lot of people to his store to shop. <laughs> but it's true. Our comets that, slant, that um, broke into different pieces when the planet Mars um, blasted billions of tons of rocks into space. So this is all about the Big Bang Theory, but basically this is known as meteoric iron. So it has its rotation through the universe, and that's a whole other subject. The gemstones sometimes have their specific shape, sometimes like a kind of a rosette, because of the gravitational forces that bring them down into the Earth. And that's what will create the shape of the gemstone. So comets, meteors, pelted our forming Earth, releasing metallic hydrogen crystals, along with frozen materials from Uranus and Neptune and carbonates and metal sulfates. That's how the early Earth was formed. So what's really neat is NASA has a probe called COBE, the Cosmic Orbital Background Explorer, that goes off into the universe and is able to see the fingerprint of different minerals and metals that it collects, different atoms, different particles. And everything has its original location. Just like in astrology, you have your astrology chart, and everything's location, location, location. You have minerals and metals that come from the icy, cold atmospheres of Uranus. And by the way, did you know that it rains diamonds on Neptune, on Uranus all the time? All the time. So if you think that's your best friend, <laughs> go to your office. Okay, but it's true, actually, science has discovered that. Um, or you can have minerals and metal that come from the red-hot orbits of mercury. And these things, these elements, these minerals, these metals, they pelt our earth all the time. It's like rain falling to our earth. So one of the things that we fear is that we are destroying the earth when we go mountaintop mining and all of these strip mining. It's true. We are destroying the earth when we do that. But the earth is not only being destroyed, it's also becoming. And we have to look at the whole picture and keep all things in balance. Okay? That's how we got here. We're a baby planet compared to the other planets. We're not getting all that stuff. Oh, pass things over. Sorry. That's a piece of lapidolite, which is kind of what you see there, uh, well, what you saw there before when I was showing the lithium pools. And they, and they kind of have a hexagonal shape. But lithium is what they crush up to make pharmaceutical lithium. It's what they used to. Now, now it's a little bit different, but this is what they used to do. You know what they use now? Well, they create lithium pools of their own. So they don't have to crush up the actual mineral. <coughs> I know. Isn't it crazy? So interesting. But what if you could say, wow, rather than taking those pharmaceuticals, I'm first going to try something like this. Or what if you had a kunzite, which is not going to be broken down in water, and you decided you're going to put your kunzite, which is a spodumene, in a glass of water every day. Just don't drink the kunzite. And you're going to allow the frequency of the kunzite into your water to restructure the water and then you're going to have water of a higher vibration that has a lithium vibration. That's a whole other class I teach on Rasa Vijay astrology, but I teach you how to do your astrology chart and determine what gemstones are best for your body, which is based on an old Vedic, now Tibetan system called Rasa Vijay. Yes? Do you believe in those copper pitchers that you look at? Yes, I do. I believe in everything. It's true. Do you believe in colloidal silver? Absolutely. It kills bacteria. The copper yes, yes. The copper has a frequency which actually instead boosts your immune system. There's a whole reason for that. Let me go to that right now because that's kind of a fun one. Give me a minute because I have to, yes. I have a 
question about that picture. Yeah. Which it's in Peru. Picture? But is that, is it the, the structure and formation of the surrounding rocks, is that from the energy? No, people built that in Peru. Oh. They, oh. Did, they did that all the time. The sacred landscape. Okay. How big is that? How big is it? Well, I haven't been there, so that one I have to admit, I got it. Whoever said that, I got that off the internet. Just like all the men I used to date off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. My husband did that. Yeah, my husband came in for a napropathic treatment, and I'm like, this guy won't leave my office. But Helen Blue said, you're going to meet the guy you're going to marry two weeks before your birthday. And it was August 16th, and my birthday is August 30th. And my next client was a friend. I said, Gail, this guy will not leave my office. And she goes, that's the guy you're going to marry. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> the problem is he didn't know. <laughs> but, you know, he was divinely set up. I called it divine intervention. He says it was divine set up. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, my, my friend over there with the camera, you told me to hit, I think, F5. I don't want to hit something without. Escape. How do I go to a different? Escape. Escape. Which I frequently want to do, but that's now. Okay, I remember you told me how to do this. That's a meteorite. That's meteoric iron. Meteoric iron, which is, yeah. yeah. Which is really important for being here, for being grounded, for incarnation. Remember, iron is a heavy stone. You know, you want to keep somebody on the planet, give them some iron to hold them down here. Keep them down here. You want to attract the incarnating soul? Well, wear a garnet. If you want to have a baby, wear a garnet. You need to increase your iron content in the body or you're going to be anemic and you won't be able, perhaps, to hold the, the incarnation. That is such a great question. Thank you. In anthroposophic medicine, Rudolf Steiner always said, there's no such thing. question is, will iron keep somebody alive? He always said, my 19-year-old can't pass the other day. I didn't think of that, but anyways. I know, he was so cool. He was a redhead and so feisty. We, we used to fight all the time. Anyways, Rudolf Steiner, leader of the, head of the Anthroposophic Society, always said that there's no such thing as an incurable disease. And if it is incurable, so he always said, if, if the disease is told to be incurable, give them iron. Iron's the anchor. And if the disease is truly incurable, then they're ready for a different experience anyways. Now think about this. If you don't have enough iron in your system, what happens to you? You become anemic. You become lightheaded. You want to sleep all the time. You're not in your body. All those things. The iron is here to keep you in the body. If you don't have enough iron, which is Mars energy, as Mars is the red hot iron planet, then you're going to be very Neptunian, which is very much on a different plane of consciousness. And Neptune's not as much in the body. You need to have that iron in your blood because iron is the carrier of the oxygen forces in the blood. Or is it the other way around? Oxygen is the carrier of the iron forces. You need to have that higher vibration matching the heavier vibration. Iron lungs, so that you can breathe. I mean, we hear about this throughout all time and space. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, right. And blood is a crystal. Okay, there was a question, and now I no longer remember what it was. Does anybody remember what it was? Otherwise, I'll just have to go somewhere else. I think you were going to do the colloidal silver. No, it was something else. All right, here's what I want to do. We're going to do something else. So Paramahansa Yogananda said, pearls and other jewels as well as metals and plants supplied directly to the skin exercise an electromagnetic influence over the physical cells of your body. Man's body, human's body, contains carbon and various elements, metallic elements, 
that are present in plants, metals, and jewels. The discovery of the rishis, which are the holy men, holy women of India, the, the discoveries of the rishis in these fields will doubtlessly receive confirmation someday from physiologists that our sensitive body, with its electrical life currents, is the center of many mysteries yet explored. So, what I would like to do now is everybody got a piece of paper that says we're going to look at one gemstone for you, for your ancestral karma, that's going to help your energy field. So in the Vedas, this is a very interesting, did everybody, does everyone know the day of the week they're born? I had a book up front and I said, know the day of the week you're born. If you do not know the day of the week you're born, you can run out in the hallway and, and or you can Google it in your phone, day of the week without sound, day of the week you're born on. If you don't know the day of your week, there is a book outside, but um, maybe we'll wait on that part of it. You can go out during, during afterwards. Okay, give me a second here. I'm going the wrong way. There's a story for everything. So in the Vedic tradition, they believe that uh, there are many ways to balance the body. Prayer, willpower, yoga, meditation, consultation with saints, um, nutrition, of course. But if you wear the right gemstone, it's going to empower your body. And all gemstones, all planets have a frequency. And the frequency that's emitted by the planet is going to match the frequency of your physical body. And it's going to, you wear the gemstones because it's going to ward off the harmful rays that the planet can emit as well or it gets entangled with as it comes down, okay, as it's emitted. So if you know one thing, it's know the day of the week that you're born. It's part of a nine box uh, description to know what's the strongest gemstone for you to wear. Yes? That book you brought has the day of the week a person is born, but does it count as a green witch time? Is that like Zoom? That's another Zoom? part of the formula. We're just doing the day because otherwise we would be here till next year. So. We're just doing the day of the week you're born on, not the time of the day you're born on, which is very important. I know, but if it's the evening, if you're born, then the yes. evening, in some other country. Like are, you born in, are you born in uh, Brazil? Yes, in the evening. So in another place... On you're the right, you're right. And I don't have the formula for that today. But you can, but um, just go with the day of the week you're born. I know that what you're getting at which has to be calculated basically, but we're not going to do that right now. So like I'm born early in the morning, but I'm born on a Thursday, which a lot of uh, cultures in the Vedas would count as Wednesday. But we're not doing that to, right now. It's not possible, okay? Okay, just stay with me. Did you figure out what day of the week you're born on? Yes. Okay, I'll have to do it for you later. Give me a minute here. Okay, so as per the legend associated with gems, it is said that King of the Demons, Bali, came into Indralok, the heaven. He wanted to win over heaven and all the gods. So legend has it that Bali had less than noble purposes and was hit by Indra over the head with the Vajra, an instrument of truth. Okay, I didn't bring a Vajra today. The demon king was shattered into pieces of gems simply because he was a unique creature himself. It is said in mythology that from the bones of this demon, King Bali, diamonds were found. From his teeth, pearls. From his blood drops, ruby. From the gallbladder, emerald. From his eyes came out blue sapphires. From the juice of his heart came lapis lazuli. From his bone marrow came carquitin, which is hesonite garnet. From his nails appeared cat eye. From his body fat came rock crystal. From flesh came coral, and from skin came yellow sapphire. From his semen appeared the gem Bisham. Now, I'm not going to read that part of it, but I want to, before we figure out what your gemstone is, I just want to pass this picture here. This is a picture of different bowls 
Um, there is an organization that goes around and does healing and spiritual work with the gemstones that come from the bones of lamas and saints. Yes, very, very, very awesome. We had the experience of having our whole uh, workshop room in Healing Earth all in gold brocades and everything when they came through and we did healings. They did healings with the bones of the different uh, Tibetan lamas. It was, it's a pretty fascinating thing. But through the crematory process, bones, uh, pearls will actually form from their bones. From saints, it, it's happened with saints as well. Could happen with you. I don't know who I'm talking to. It's pretty fascinating when you think about it. Okay, so. Which way is this going, Mary? Just not going to read the whole thing. Wearing the right gemstone also can slow down the rate of entropy, which is the rate of uh, when you expire, so to say. Let's see. So it helps us to conserve our vital energy. It's part of vibrational resonance. We're not going to go through all of this. Whoops. Did I go to the wrong place? Here we are. Who's born on a Sunday? Anybody born on a Sunday? So I'm going to use the Vedic gemstones, but I also use other gemstones as well. So Sunday is the ruler of ruby and the, and the element of gold. If the sun is exalted in your chart, you'll be well-read, pious, strong, compassionate, and untroubled. Maybe you'll even be a ruler. So Leo rules Sunday, Leo rules the sun, and we have a, we have a ruler right now. I mean, it, it can also be dictators, too. We have a ruler right now who has a Leo rising with Mars and Leo on his rising sign. Mars on the rising can be, unless it you know, has good aspects by other things, can be a little pushy and boisterous. You know, I'm just saying. He, he may be a Gemini, but I just want to say, he's got his sun sign conjunct Uranus, which is in the sign of Gemini, which rules the hands, which is completely unpredictable. Anything he does with his hands, beyond the tweets, <laughs> is completely unpredictable. But it's also conjunct one of the trans-Neptunian planets called Volcanus, which means he erupts all the time. So the problem with that is he doesn't have the chemistry in his chart to know when to lay back and think about something first. Because Mercury rules your rational consciousness, and his rational consciousness is square Neptune. You know what that is? Kofefe. <laughs> I can't make this step up, it writes itself. <laughs> yes? So what gemstone should we send him that he should wear? <laughs> right now, the only gemstone I want to send him is for Saturn. Karma. <laughs> yes, that's a great, that was great, Jim. Dr. Jim back there asked, he said, can we put it on his picture? You know, that's a whole form of healing with crystals, and I actually have a box that I put people's pictures in and put crystals by it and then illuminate it with different colors. Okay, you can do it vaguely, you can do it according to the birth dates, or you can just do it according to your intuition and what you're wanting to send. But even if you take a picture, even if you have a picture of Donald Trump, this is a great experiment. Jim, you're right up here for me right now. This is an experiment for all those who are inclined to be part of this noble experiment of healing our nation, healing Syria, healing the cradle of, you know, the cradle of humanity, is to take a picture of Donald Trump. You know, maybe put it where you don't have to look at it all the time. And put, put a loving crystal on there. And, you know, honestly, okay, Saturn's not strong in his chart. He has Saturn in Cancer. That's another story, but uh, let's see, what would be his strongest? His Jupiter is really strong in his chart, and his Mars, well, not his Mars, okay. His Jupiter is really strong, so you could do yellow sapphire. That's for wisdom. We want this guy to get some. Compassion. His Venus is okay, even though it's conjunct Saturn. 
You could use Venus kind of stones. I know where I was going before when I got lost now. <laughs> you could use Venus kinds of stones. Um, you could use copper. Venus rules diamond. It's Friday, but we're not there yet. Let's do this first, and then if you could kindly remind me that I want to go to the copper stones, because that tells a big story. Or actually, I think we're going to go there now, because we're just starting this. Okay, copper stones like malachite. Um, I'm going to pass a couple of my babies here, because my babies like to be photographed. You might have noticed that. I don't photograph so well, so if my gemstones photograph well, I'm happy. Okay. Pass this one here, and I'll pass the other side. Thank you. And this one's going to be chrysocolla, also a high copper stone. I have a bunch of copper stones up there. No, that's chrysocolla, but they're from the same family. And the point is, is you know that in Tibetan tradition, they often will wear, and in, in uh, native healing traditions, they'll often wear copper bracelets, or they will, and, and that's very big in the Vedas, and to wear different combinations of, of uh, bracelets, like uh, gold with copper, with silver, with whatever. Anyways, different bangles. Okay, it's... <laughs> right. So the, you can also wear it with malachite or turquoise. Turquoise is another copper uh, stone. It comes from copper veins. I'll just pass a piece on each side so you can see it. Copper is, I mean, uh, turquoise, malachite, azurite, chrysocolla, cobaltamine. Those are all stones that are very high in copper. And copper, when it... Um, it turns a blue-green when it uh, oxidates. And blue-green is, is the color you're supposed to use for burns. Anytime you have a burn, that is the color you're supposed to use. So if you're dealing with color healing therapy, you want to stream a light, a color light of, of turquoise on your skin to heal the burn. That's how come, that is how Garadelli Dinshaw went to jail. Because he was able to heal burns faster than the medical profession in those days just by using turquoise light. You know, if you have a cure for something, you got to watch it. You heard what's going on. We're not going there. Just get that picture of Donald Trump and do the work. <laughs> Anyways, if you wear copper on your skin, copper will be reabsorbed by the buffer salts in your skin to then create copper salts in your body. So that's even if you're wearing gemstones like malachite, azurite, turquoise, any of those, chrysocolla. If you wear it on your skin, it's going to be reabsorbed by the buffer salts in your skin to produce copper salts in your system, which then create superoxide dismutase, which is one of the antioxidant enzymes to help free radical damage. So you're going to do that. I'll pat myself on the back for that, because this is all work I've put together over the years. Yes? Again, that it, it's reabsorbed by the salt, the buffer salt, and creates creates copper salts, which then produce antioxidant enzymes such as superoxide dismutase, dismutase, say that fast, which help to fight cancer and back aches and different free radical damages in the physical body. Okay, I'll just say that a lot of this is in my book, and a lot more will be in the next books that I should have written ten years ago. But I'm getting there. Okay, so in India, back in the day, they used gemstones for healing, and they had a system to use gemstones for healing that were based on the planetary positions in your specific astrology charts when you took your first breath and said, hello world. Does anybody know the wisdom that we use today for wearing gemstones, the birthstones? It's the hallmark. There is none. In 1912, the National Association of Retailer Jewelers put together an arbitrary list. It was held for me in the store. Everybody would say, I want my birthstone. I want my birthstone. And I'd be like, God, I need to make the money, but I can't con these people. You can't con people. The reality is, is that you're born in the month of January, right? You're December 31st, right? I keep forgetting you're not January 1st. You're January. So my friend Rosemary here is born in the month of December. Well, December is the fine 
uh, the fine sign of Capricorn, along with the very free, wild, and crazy sign of Sagittarius. Now, Sagittarius is a fire sign, and Capricorn is an earth sign. There's no way earth and fire together scorch. There's no way that you can give them one birthstone that's going to be the same, that's going to make sense for them. It's got to be more specific. So now we have our fine friend here who's, who's born on the 25th of January. So we know he's an Aquarius, early degrees of Aquarius, but his same month is also Capricorn. So we have air and earth together. Well, they just kind of mingle together. They don't do anything. And you're born in what month? February. Okay. 17th Aquarius also. So February is Aquarius, but we also know in the month of February, we also have Pisces. Again, that's air and water. And, and there's no... Yeah, you can't, you can't give them the same gemstone. It just doesn't work that way. So I call that the hallmark system. You know, there's a card for everything. Okay, so who was born on Sundays? Okay, a lot of people born on Sundays here. So Sunday is ruby, just in general. Sunday is ruby. And of course I have a ruby to pass. Hang on one second. Wait, there's a gemstone for that. Well, this is a real pretty ruby. I think we'll... Oh, both of these are unpolished rubies, so I'll just pass this one over here, but I'll show you how pretty that one is. Isn't that great? So we'll start this one with you, Rosemary. Did you pass that one around? Here, do you want me to? You can just, yeah, pass it that way, I'll go this way. I'll just start with you over here. Okay, so, so we know that the sun has a certain level of nobility. No, that's a ruby. That's what a ruby looks like in its natural state. And if you're born on a Sunday, you should wear a ruby to strengthen your heart and your constitution. So ruby, in general, hang on one second, aside from being for foolish behavior, red color waves are hot and therefore useful in curing diseases caused by, I'm going to sound like a drug company's uh, kind of thing here, um, excess cold moisture in the body, colds, flu, anemia, low blood pressure, heart and circulatory problems, as well as foolish behavior and learning disabilities. Okay, so that's being very general, but I'm giving you one of your ancestral karmas, because if you're born on a Sunday, the theory is, is that you take after somebody in your family who exhibits those kind of qualities. So maybe somebody in your family had heart disorder if you're born on a Sunday. Just something to think about, or more, maybe they were anemic or had low blood pressure. Take, for instance, the situation with, um, oh, which one was it? He was a basketball star. Julius Irving, was it? The one who went to the dentist and, and died? But he was born on a Sunday, and if he would have worn a ruby, would have that strengthened his constitution? I don't know. But there's wisdom. Do you know where this wisdom for the Vedas? It comes from the Rig Veda over 15,000 years ago. We have two Vedic positions in our audience right now. Right? Can you hold your hand? Dr. Archana Lal Chabak and Dr. Jim Lal Chabak. Yes, we're going there. Okay, who's born on a Monday? Okay, Monday is ruled by the moon. The element is either going to be uh, platinum or silver. Uh, on a Monday, the cosmic color of Monday is orange. So orange is, pearl is the color to wear. Now this is really interesting, um, and we didn't talk a lot about my elements chart, but this is really important. If you look at the, uh, pearls are a calcium carbonate, and if you look at the frequency of calcium and carbonate, it's orange and yellow respectively. You get the orange and yellow, they come together, they produce the innermost color of pearl. Did you know that the innermost color of water is also orange? Did you know that water is the second chakra, which is also orange? You see how there's this all pinning this thing together, which is never, which, okay. My book won an award for it years ago by the Visionary Arts um, retailers. Anyways, because I, I kind of created the dots. That's a Gemini thing to do, connect the dots. We connect the dots. So orange is the cosmic color transmitted by pearls and other lunar gems. Now maybe you can't afford to buy pearls, but maybe you can get a moonstone instead. 
Maybe you can't afford rubies, but you can get a red tourmaline. Um, red gemstones are hard to come by. Uh, orange waves are cold, therefore useful in treating diseases of body secretions and blood caused by excess heat in the body. So it's really good for any kind of mental derangement, excess heat in the heart and the brain. Um, so it's interesting because the moon rules the rational consciousness in astrology. So if you, does anybody have tinnitus? Okay. This is very interesting. Aside from some really amazing vitamins I sell that I recommend for tinnitus, tinnitus is actually caused by your brain being on fire, and the moon is going to put out the fire, and the moon deals with the functional aspect. Everybody thinks it's the ears, but it's not. If you take things that cool you down, that cool down your brain, not only will you focus better, but you're also going to get rid of your tinnitus, which is this frequency of inflammation going on in your brain. Pretty crazy when you think about it. Anyways, there was a famous president that I didn't vote for that was born on a Monday who died of a brain disorder that had nothing to do with the rational consciousness but had everything to do with the functional aspects. And that was Ronald Reagan who died of Alzheimer's. Now, theoretically, if he wore his pearl, which it's really hard to get men to wear their pearls, but if he would have worn his pearl and gone to a good Vedic uh, jeweler, they could have hid it underneath a different stone on top. There's all these games that can be played. Perhaps he'd be 120 and still be with us. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Give me one second. I want to find something in my notes. So Pearl also works with high blood pressure, asthma, flu, pneumonia, tonsillitis, bronchitis, chicken pox. It's effective against high acidity. Well, the moon rules water. You want to get people with high acidity, which causes inflammation, to drink more water. And the innermost color of water is orange. It just works that way. I can't make this stuff up. OK, it's also anti-allergenic and moist. OK, who's born on a Tuesday? Whoa, that's Mercury. What happened to Tuesday? What? There's Mercury. Mars. Okay, Mars. Mars. Okay, um, by the way, jumping back to Moon. Moon is for gardeners, for cooks. You kind of look, if you're born on a Monday, do you pull from anybody in your family who had those kinds of occupations? Maybe. And you're just looking to balance. All you're doing is looking to balance. You're looking to balance off the frequency, the rays that are not healthy for you and bring in the ones that are. Okay, so who's born on Mars? Uh, Tuesday. Okay, who's born on Mars? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mars, Mars is uh, coral, red coral. So I'll pass a piece of red coral around. I'm passing the stones so you get an opportunity to see them up front. Okay, hang on to that one, okay? We'll get to Saturday. Okay, so Mars rules, uh, emits a yellow cosmic ray, and it's warming, and it's used to treat colic, gallstones, hemorrhoids, warts, problems such as jaundice, hepatitis. It's enlivening for cleaning the bowels and clearing bloods and boils and all of those things. It's always exciting, but, you know, we're in the overheated blood season right now, basically, right? Mm -hmm. and so it's really good for people to do herbs that grow this season, like dandelion, that help to clear and clean the blood systems of the body. Okay, so red coral, okay, I'm not going to say that bit. Um, anyways, that's Mars. So Mars, when you think of Mars, Mars is coral. When you think of Mars, you think of butchers, <laughs> you think of warriors, you know, Mars, the god of war. You think of, uh, you know, think of if you're born on a Tuesday, who in your family might you pull similar things from? Um, who maybe was a butcher or made tools or even was a jeweler, a metalsmith. Um, there's so many things, or went to war or anything like that. Usually when I do this class and I'm a little more relaxed about it, we find that there are people that makes it makes perfect sense for or who in your family had blood that would boil, would be impatient, 
with, you know, and that's the lesson that we need to learn with Mars. Mars is great if we can apply that energy, you know, and, and, and harness that energy. Otherwise, it just runs you over with your car and Mars rules cars. Or run you over with your mouth, which a lot of people run you over with your mouth. Some days are like that, is what I like to say. Okay. Who's born on a Wednesday? Did you, are you on a Tuesday? Mars rules cars. But it, it's part of the whole process. Everything has a relationship. Actually, Mercury rules transportation, but Mars rules cars because Mars rules the metal on cars. Okay. So who's born on a okay, Wednesday? So Wednesday is actually Mercury, which rules the rational consciousness of the, of the brain. So that's really important if anybody has any kind of... Uh, either talks too fast, any learning disabilities, you know, or can't keep their thoughts together, emerald, or drinking a lot of chlorophyll, because you're using the color vibration. Okay, so the green cosmic ray transmitted by emeralds and other green stones relate to the earth and the elements that are cold by nature. So with emerald, it treats burns, colitis, cystitis, diarrhea, heartburn, eczema, inflammation, stomach ulcers, and even anorexia. It's analgesic, and it helps to, uh, to treat things that are caused by excess heat. So there's a lot more that goes with all of this. I'm just kind of giving you some fun stuff to go with. But Wednesday deals with teachers quite often. And people who, even writers. So if you're born on a Wednesday, do you relate to anybody in your family, perhaps, who was a teacher or a writer? I actually have had an ulcer before, and one of the best cures are things, of course, that cool it down, like aloe vera or chlorophyll, things of that nature. But my dad was a teacher. But I'll show you on the next day, because I pull exactly from him and my grandfather. Okay. We're going to go to Jupiter. Who's born on Thursday? Okay. And you might want to write this down on the notes that I gave you as well. And are the gemstones making it to the back of the class or did they get lost somewhere around here? If you want to stick around a few minutes afterwards, I'll re-show them to you. Okay, so Jupiter rules Thursday. And Thursday also rules the metal tin. Uh, it oftentimes rules uh, leaders and teachers and writers as well and bankers. It's golden. Well, light blue is the cosmic color, but you'll see Thursday. I don't have any sapphires here, but I do have a ruby, a, a um, golden imperial topaz here, which is really good for treating the fat systems of the body. Okay, but I'm gonna just pass the citrine around to give you the idea of the color. So, yes, wear a ton of bathing. I'm going to go take a bath in yellow sapphire and golden imperial topaz. But that's what it rules. Okay, so Thursday, which is yellow sapphire, and I was born on a Thursday, is good for swollen glands, glands, mumps, ulcerations of the mouth, abscesses, epilepsy, cough, scoiters, pancreatic disorders, and obesity. It also rules the liver. Jupiter rules the liver. Now, my father had hepatitis a lot. That's another story. And my grandfather on the other side of the family had, um, uh, what do you call it, um, cirrhosis of the liver. Like I said, we're Jews, we can't drink. He didn't drink. That's just the, you know, that goes along with our lineage. Long story short, every time I go to a Vedic healer or every time I go to an acupuncturist and they take my pulse, they always tell me I have an overheated liver situation. And... Spring has a lot to do with overheated liver situations. So every time spring comes along, I feel it more. My eyes don't focus as well, and I've got to take all my herbs to help bring me back into balance. Or I could just wear my, maybe not just wear, because you want to really bring all these things in together. But put your yellow sapphire on. Put your citrine on. You know, depending on your budget, get lots of yellow sapphires instead of golden imperial topaz. Whatever you can afford. The reason why these, th these gemstones are recommended in the Vedas is because this is what was available back then. And what they did back then is they would create these bonsas out of the gemstone. They would burn the gemstone 
and the royalty would eat it. So they would eat the gemstones, and it would be another kind of a kind of like a homeopathic formula. What is it down to? It's an ash. It's an ash. So they would eat the ash. Yeah. Huh? Or they would put it in different formulas with different herbs and things. We can't all afford to do that. Plus, I covet my gemstones. I wouldn't do that at all. <laughs> yeah. Instead, you can make vibrational essences out of it, make vibrational waters. That's a whole other topic, of course. This can go on forever. Except that I. Um, okay, who's born on a Friday? Okay, we got a couple Friday. Friday's diamond. And let me tell you something else, because this is fun. If you don't have this strong in your chart, and this and this planet is weak in your chart, and you wore a diamond, it would be a big mistake, because maybe your marriage wouldn't be so great, like Princess Di, who wore a diamond with sapphire. That's Venus and Saturn together. That's holy back love. If Venus is in the sign of Capricorn, okay, we look at the whole chart, but it holds back your natural ability to flow from the heart center. Okay? Now... Listen, nobody has a perfect chart, okay? Nobody. As a matter of fact, if you looked at the chart of the Dalai Lama or some of the great people who have really, you know, held great positions in this world, moved this consciousness forward, they have crappy charts. <laughs> Could you imagine the work of having to hold together a whole nation and not be in that nation? That's a hard chart to have. But they do, they do the work in spite of that. It's the energy of the soul that you bring in, and then you have that chart to work with. Everybody is going to have a pot of gold in their astrology chart. Everybody's, mine is in my house of friends, so I like friends with money. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it is in my house of friends. But everybody has their gold somewhere. We don't get everything, but we get a lot of really good things. So we have to... You know, we have to play that up, or we have to rely on that. Okay, so Venus is diamond. It emits an indigo blue ray, which is uh, prescribed for sterility, problems related to menopause. It's effective in treating paralysis, epilepsy, depression, venereal complaints. It's invigorating, stimulating, clarifying. It deals with all the watery elements of the body, even mucus, hormones, sperm, and semen. That doesn't sound like too much fun, but you want to be in balance, and that's just what it is. Venus is oftentimes artisans, so you'll often see it in the charts of artists, where you might see the moon, you know, with gardeners and cooks. You know, we all have things that we do really well. Keep in mind, this is only one part, one small part of a big system, but it's the easy part to do because it's the day of the week you're born on. Okay? We're not getting into hours. Okay, who was born on Saturn? Shani. Okay, you too. You were born on Saturday. So violet is the cosmic ray transmitted by blue sapphires and other natural blue gemstones. Now I just happen to have some not too expensive sapphires here. And I happen to have some lapis, which is also the same color so a sapphire and a lapis on each side. Here you go, the dream. Now also, if you can't afford sapphires, you may instead want to have an amethyst. Okay? I'm just saying. This is one of my tiny ones. <laughs> I love yeah. to brag. Yeah. Okay. I'm just kidding. Okay, so... When we deal with sapphire, we deal with the uh, cold cosmic ray of violet. It's effective for joint pain, back aches, headaches. It's good for earache, scalp, dandruff, eczema, alopecia, laryngitis, neuralgia, vertigo, and, syst and symptoms of Parkinson's. So it's cooling, soothing, antispasmodic, and tranquilizing. It's good for any kind of suffering and, cr and chronic conditions which is what Saturn rules. And this is Saturday, Saturn's day, and this is Saturn's gemstone. Okay, did I depress anybody yet? <laughs> it's just about balance, and this is only one part of it. I tend to really like the natural healing side of things. 
There, of course, also is the cosmic element of all things as well. But let's pass around a couple other stones. Coral. That's red coral. That's okay. If you can, you can put it on your table, you don't have to do that, Rosemary. Okay. Okay. Do you have a chair? Do we have a question thus far? That's citrine. That will give you an idea of the color vibration. Let's go up to Celestite. And I'm going to pass a piece on each side. Yes, I do. Did you fall asleep during Saturday? Come on. We'll get there later then. Okay. Well, it did come out the pretty color that it is, but it really looks like shining stars. Now, one of my favorite stones for keeping by the side of my bed is a celestite. Celestite is a strontium sulfate, and sulfur in anthroposophic healing, or homeopathic healing, helps to push out the monkey mind, to allow the vegetative processes of the body to do its upbuilding work, to repair. So interestingly, the first 90 minutes that your head hits the pillow, is the largest repair cycle of the body as well. So it's very important not to put quartz crystal, which is for cosmic consciousness and its frequency, and it's going to be ah, all out there. You won't get any sleep at all. But you would rather have a strontium sulfate, which is a natural sedative for the nervous system. Yes? You're all surviving me just fine, thank you. Let's see what else we can talk about. I have so much. We did turquoise. I forgot to show the pictures. Oh, Jade. I love talking about Jade. And actually, before we even get there, I just want to say, when you go to buy gemstones, buy the gemstone that speaks to you. And start collecting nice stones that speak to you, that never go down in value, like Tibetan bowls or different artifacts, unlike, you know, lots of things that you buy that we trash. Buy things that mean something to you. They'll never go down in value. Gemstones go up in value. If I had back then what I have now, I would be taking you all to Hawaii. Or I'd be like Oprah, I'd be getting you all a car. You get a car. You get a car. Get a car. <laughs> but... Gemstones only go up in price, and sometimes the bigger the gemstone doesn't indicate that the gemstone is more valuable. Now I'm checking all of you. Does anybody know what this is? I'm going to pass this around, keep it to yourself, just pass it around, and I'm going to do the same. I'll start one over here. I'll start one with Nadrine. They're the same family, but they're just color differences slight. And now I'll get back to Jade. <laughs> okay, the person who could tell me that what that is is going to win a prize. But keep it to yourself, and then you can raise your hand one at a time. Okay. This is a Jade I'm going to pass around. Jade comes from the crystal serpentine family. Jades are silicates. What are they? Got already. It's Spanish for Piedra de Yada, which means pain on, the, pain on the side. So the Spaniards used to put them over the kidney to help hit, heal the pain from kidney stones. Now, jade is a silicate of sodium, aluminum, calcium, and iron. Thus, its prime element, sodium, is essential for regulating proper kidney function because venous, kidney, sodium, they all are ruled by that. So here we have the aluminum in the jade, you put it on the kidney, and it's helped pooling out the stone to put it into the blood system, to help to put it into the interstitial fluids of the system, to help bring it into a buffering situation. Now, what else do we use that's really high in aluminum that pulls out impurities from the body? I know that in indigenous cultures, they filter their water supply through aluminum. But also, clay is high in aluminum. And if we have a lot of zits on our face, and I say that with the utmost respect and love for everyone in this room, we're going to do a clay mask, right? 
it makes total sense. So from a gemstone healing perspective, if you were to put an element that's high in aluminum over the kidneys, it's going to help bring the stones out into solution. And the jade itself is very high in silica, which converts in the body if we're low on calcium, which is very basic, which helps to buffer an over-acidic system. And where do we get kidney stones from? It's usually a diet that's really acid, too much meat, too much milk, you know, all of those things, too much sugar, the things that cause acid in the system. So in, Japan, in China, they actually crush up jade, and you take them as uh, gemstone, uh, you take them as tablets, vitamin tablets. Or they have the jade rollers for the face. Or they have, um, you know, the jade masks you put on to help clean to for your there's probably a lot more. I know that they use tourmaline and rollers and all these things. It's a crazy world out there. But this whole world would not work without gemstones. Even your car wouldn't start without a gemstone, and your refrigeration due to, you know, due to fluorite and the fluorocarbons wouldn't work without fluorite. Computers wouldn't work without gemstones, without crystals. And what they do is they take these massive bits of crystal and they crush them up and they use them for technology. So it's not people like us who collect gemstones, Gesundheit, who collect gemstones. We're actually the living museums. We're the keepers of these sacred objects that we can pass to our family or we can use for our retirement or however you do things. And certainly use them for your healing purposes. You know, this was an intro to gemstones today, but this was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Yes. And it made you think, wow, maybe this isn't so woo-woo juju after all. But it doesn't matter if it is, because woo-woo juju is a very happy, loving vibration. And if that's the best that we can do with that right now, it's okay to be loving and open and kind and compassionate and healing and accepting and tolerant and all those fine things. So, anyways, that's what I had to say about that. Yes? I think that's going to be in the back of the room. Yes. So I do a whole bunch of different workshops on astrology and healing with astrology. Hi there. I just noticed you were here. Um, I do a bunch of different crystal healings. If we had time today, we would have done a crystal meditation, but that's over a half hour, so we go through all the chakras and healings. And the different vibrations of the different energies of the stones have color frequencies that relate to the different... Where did I leave my glasses? <laughs> Are they out my head? They're on the beach of the bowl. Look down. In front of the bowl. Oh, thank you. I can't find them anywhere. Yes. Question. Gemstones are for healing. How does that interact with karma? Well, it's your karma if you pick up that gemstone, isn't it? <laughs> Why can't... It's an aid. So I look at it from this perspective. It's no different than a book that you pick up that gives you the wisdom that you need. It's no different than eating the right foods. It's no different than doing your morning jabas and your meditations. The great thing about gemstones is I may forget to take my vitamins and I may forget to do my meditation, which I'm guilty of too often. I may forget to be nice sometimes, but that's not too often. But I, no self-respecting crystal healer is ever going to forget to put all her crystals on. Which, by the way, right? Right. They work on you whether you're conscious of them working or not. They just work. And we are opening up to a world that is so much more than what we ever thought it could be. I am going to be doing a crystal weight loss class. It's going to be um, in an evening class. You could see that when I take off all my crystals, I'll probably lose 10 pounds. <laughs> I'm going to put something together for the internet on that. I've been meaning to do that forever. Yes, Where Linda. can we buy good Tibetan bowls? Because you said it was a family secret, how yeah. they wanted the metals and stuff. Where can we get them? It is such a hard thing, but Richard Rudis, when he comes to town, do you know Richard Rudis? Okay. He's fabulous, by the way. Um, he goes and handpicks the bowls. I used to handpick the bowls. Hi. I just noticed you were here too. I love it. All my friends. It's friend week here. So 
Yes. You could even have some people will play them for you over the phone till you get the one that has the right sound. I don't have contacts for that like I used to. That was a beautiful 20-some years of my life, and I'm really sad to let it go, but it um, had to evolve into other things. Yes, hi. Do you have any success stories of working with people with, say, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, the three biggest failures? Okay, from a nutritional standpoint. Yeah. This person came in with cancer, and this is what we did. Okay, so that's a really big question she just asked me. Do I have any success stories with people who have heart disease, cancer, other things like that? And I will say, I haven't done as much other than tell them what to do, and I don't see people on a weekly basis. Being a full-time astrologer, I usually see them once a year, and then they'll call me for things, and I give them suggestions. I haven't opened up like I used to, where I would see people on a weekly basis. That was about 30 years ago. So I personally am not in that space, but Dr. Lal Tabak, Archana, could be a perfect person to work with. And I'm always good to put my two cents in. My gift is timing and cycles. I like to look at the chart and tell you when the cycles are that you should watch for. I have lots of cycle, uh, charts I've done where I've told somebody, you need to go to the doctor, period. Heart problems, and you know they're not going to eat healthy, so don't, you know, you give them some recommendations, but there's a lot of people who know better than you, so it is what it is. I've had unfortunately people die during heart cycles when I've given them the warning to go to the doctor, and they don't. But I've also had people have good results. You know, sometimes the dentist is the easy one to see in the chart. You send people to the dentist, they're like, oh, God, I'm so glad you sent me at the right time. It was, you know, you catch something. So, no, I may not be that person, but I can help. Do you know of any research that's done that can validate any of this? There's tons of research done. But there's also, the reason why I won the award on my book is because I put a lot of these pieces together. But you may notice, and I'm not saying this just to sound like a hot shot, most of the books on the market don't do it. If you read most of the books on the market, and I'm not saying that my book is better than anyone's, you know, I'm still a baby. I'm being very, very, very honest about this. Most of the books on the market, every third stone you read is going to take you off the planet and make you give you the greatest consciousness that you could imagine. But that's not how the gemstones all work. Some of them are for that. Some of them are for sleep. Some of them are for balance. Some of them are for nutrition. Some of them are for digestion. Some of them are to just for, you know, anti-inflammatory processes. So I am in the process of writing about six books. I've been saying that for a gazillion years. But I'm hoping this is the year, because it's this year and next year. It's really good in my chart. So. And I'll do the best I can. Okay. Hi. Hi. Are there any local junk stores that you can recommend? Dave's Rock Shop. And on the rocks. On the rocks on Clark Street. So she asked me if there are any local gemstone uh, gem shops I could recommend. You know the problem with buying gemstones over the internet because I do it all the time. I think I'm a hot shot and I've been on things on eBay and I just noticed you're here too. Is um, when you get them, they're like crazy smaller than you thought they were going to be. I know. I fall for it too, and it's, it, it makes me crazy. So I keep dreaming about having another big gem fair, and I will. So please just leave me your name, and I don't, I do not send a lot of emails, by the way. I'm very, I'm very judicious on the way I send emails. So you're not going to get a whole bunch of crazy crap. Okay. I didn't know. Can you tell I'm a little tired? I get up really early. Any other questions? Yes. And then I do have a few more things, unless we're at that time. Does size matter? Oh, that's a great question. She asked me if size mattered. Why well, yeah, No. <laughs> size, size never matters. Purity matters. You know, somebody may have a bigger brain, but if your brain is pure, I'll go with you any day, you know? So it's the purity and the intensity of the integrity. If you can radiate integrity and purity, size never matters. That's like going up to Buddha or Muhammad or Jesus or, 
you know, Amachananda or any of the great saints out there and saying to them, dude, you could have got the whole world if you had a bigger crystal. Right? You know? It doesn't work that way. But what really does work is that you have a relationship with the crystals that you have. You don't have to run out and get everything. When I had Healing Earth, it was always constant that people would run in with a bag of gemstones and say, I forgot what all of these are. What do they do? <laughs> Just get things that you love, that you're going to work with. You know, that kind of energy is so much better. I did have in the early days of Healing Earth, we recommended a peridot to somebody's bird that looked like it was dying. And the bird came back and bounced back. I don't remember the reasoning on it right now, but I think it was digestion, because peridot has a relationship for releasing. Now, there's iron in your jade, and the Orientals often recommend that you wear jade for fertility as well. So that's a good stone, jade garnets for fertility. Um, another stone I like to talk about is rhodochrosite, a very beautiful stone. I actually like to talk about all my stones, but... <laughs> but that's another story. Here's a road of curse that I'll cast around. And if you look at the element for color sheet, which I didn't do a good job of working with today, you'll see that road of crocite has a high degree of carbon, which vibrates yellow on the chromatographic scale, along with, um, I gotta remember everything, along with silica, which vibrates orange on the chromatographic scale, manganese, which vibrates scarlet on the chromatographic scale. Now, if you take those three colors and put them together, you've got kind of a grapefruit, and that's what rhodochrosite looks like. This isn't going to be true with all gemstones, but it's excitingly true with lots of gemstones. And nobody has ever made that cross before. And again, you know, I want to take it to the next level and the next level, but it's an exciting piece that I only discovered when I was studying the work of Dr. Uh, um, Ghirardelli Dinshaw, the book Darius Dinshaw wrote. And he says, and if you want to know a true, true, true healer, he says, copy my material and use it freely. He didn't say, call me with royalty checks. I notice a lot of the gemstone information that's out there on the market today sounds the same, everybody's repeating the same thing, or oftentimes. So this isn't true. I'm not saying there aren't good books out there, because there are some really good books out there. But what I am saying is that a lot of times people just repeat things, and it becomes a thing. Like citrine, like selenite for clean, cleaning all your stones. Nobody has ever shown me how that actually works. Maybe it does, but I don't know. I just know that everybody repeats it. I know that I have some big pieces of selenite. It's kind of cool to put stuff on it. But I know that they also crush selenite to make plaster of Paris. So maybe it, maybe it plugs the holes of your org body or something of that nature. Or citrine in the cash register. That's another big one. How does citrine bring you money? Well, it does have a little bit of iron in it. I mean, maybe you can use it for consciousness work. But if you really, really want to attract something, you have to work with ferrodynamics. You have to work with ferromagnetic principles. And that's iron. So iron, if you want to work with manifesting what you want in the world, get a hunk, a hunk, a chunk of iron. You know, I throw, you know, you throw paper clips at it and they stick. <laughs> throw your wishes at it with a paper clip and it's going to stick. You're going to get what you want. So... Iolite is a stone I like to talk about. I don't have a piece of iolite with me, but it's really beautiful. And I'll just pass it around the card so you can see what it looks like. That's a piece of iolite. Mystical blue violet iolite is a water sapphire representing the legendary moon goddess Io, which is also Isis. She nurtures us with the milk of the galaxies. Did you know that gal galaxies came from the Greek gala, which means milk? I know because I lived in Greece for a while, so it was always Nescafe, Megala, Kizakari, you know, some coffee with sugar and cream. But the Milky Way, it's named after gala. What's the other one I wanted to say? Oh, I can't remember it. Cosmos. Cosmos means jewel. 
I love that one. Anyways, it's a crown chakra stone with a reputation to give a desire to taste heaven. And it relieves stress and cramping. So iolite is a silicate of magnesium and aluminum. Aluminum is a drawing agent. So it's going to, um, and nutritionally, magnesium thrusts white light into our fibers. Do you remember working with the magnesium blowtorches in chemistry in, in high school? It would thrust white light. But that's what magnesium does in the physical body, nutritionally. That's how it works. It works as a light principle, not a dense principle. And so it thrusts light into our dense fibers and silicas for universal consciousness. Let's go on universal consciousness for one minute, or maybe I'll finish something, actually. So additionally, during moon time, magnesium is really low in the female body. So if you had a piece of magnesium with you when you were going through menstrual um, time, it would help supply the magnesium that you need because we're on the low ebb of magnesium. Okay, but going, going to universal consciousness and crystals, the outer covering of our planet is 85% aperiodic crystals. It's quartz crystals. Crystals are for communication. According to Barbara Marciniak in Bringers of the Dawn, Earth is the planet of communications. It is the planet of connection. And so in your physical body, silica is always going to be the outer covering. If you looked at your skin cells under a microscope, there's silicon dioxide. They're, they're what produce your um, super squamous and uh, I forgot the other name of the cell, columnar cells. They're all going to be six-sided in nature, just exactly as every single quartz crystal on this planet. On your bones, the outside of the covering of bones is always going to have a certain silica principle to it. Boron and phosphorus are deeper. They're on the inside of the bones. You have phosphorus and snowflakes, and that's how snowflakes fall to the earth, because there's a better density to it. But consciousness, but silica is for outer consciousness. It's the brain, it's connecting, it's sending thoughts, it's reading other people's minds. If you look at the outer shell of a turtle, which I have somewhere in all my slides, it's always going to be six-sided, 13 six-sided cells or 13 moons on a turtle's back. If you look at the a beehive, it's all silica cells, all densely packed silica, silica cells. They're always going to be six-sided cells. And you find this repeating itself throughout nature. And this is how it works. But in a human, it's going to have human character to it. In a plant or an animal, it's going to be more vegetative or more, you know, their specifics. And, and same thing in a mineral, in a gemstone. So as I started this whole thing, and I said, every one of you are pristine, gorgeous, crystalline energies of light and frequency. And every one of you is dirt, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience.